Welcome to another episode. You know it, unresolved textual tension. Today, Maria is not joining us for this nugget, but William and I are here. William, rugged, handsome, as always. The book we're doing today is Not Good for Maidens by Tori. Bovolino. Bovolino. It has cool cover art. That is the one thing it has going for it, yes. That is not the one thing it has going for it, but I will admit. I think me and uh, Katie will have be having a bit of a disagreement on um, this one, so that'll be interesting. No, we will not be having a huge disagreement. I just think there's good bones in the beginning, but that's it. The basic premise of this book is that it's kind of a modern fairy tale. Right, where there's like modern day stuff and there's an underground world of fairies. And I found it to be trite. My overall impressions of this book are not great. I found it really to be a slog to listen to. I think the Agreed. structure of having two viewpoints, one of which is 20 years before and one 20 years after, is actually super ineffective and hurts the book. What happened is at the beginning, the book starts 20 years before the, the present day, right? And I was like, oh, this is a great prologue. It's creepy, it's atmospheric. It sets us up for the mystery to come. And then the book kept going back to that time period. And I was like, but why is this going to become a feature of this book now? And yeah, half this book is the before timeline. And the problem is that nothing that happens in that timeline, we didn't already know from the prologue. So I was like, why are we going through this? Best examples of this is like, okay, you know the scene where they chew on the uh, rosemary and thyme or whatever, and then they get shuffed back out of the market. They do that scene twice. And they are, it, why did you repeat the scene? It's almost word for word, the same thing. The structure of it in that way is very boring because also this is not that complicated of a world. We get it. Like this is not like a brand new setting that you need to really be helping us out understand. So like we don't need to go in depth through a lot of these moments. And the other big problem I had with the book is that it isn't actually very creepy or atmospheric past a certain point because the rules of the universe are immediately explained to us and it's just Buffy rules. It was a very disappointing book in that I kept being like, why is this not more... Like, make something up more interesting, author. Do better. The goblins are so boring. And yeah. the goblin world is so one-dimensional. You know what it reminded me of? It just reminded me of, like, you know how it gets... Um, in this world, the goblin is world market is underneath the um you know the city and it just goes down 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 like labyrinthian style and then the deeper you go the more dangerous it gets but you know what it weirdly reminded me of it have you ever watched uh as above yes yes i've watched that movie yeah you know the like where they get deeper and it's just like empty rooms and like like dusty places i thought this was supposed to be a goblin market like it's empty below there's like empty rooms like, where are all the people? And also, why are there only goblins? Wouldn't there be other fae at the goblin market? Why do people want to go to the goblin market if all they're selling is human body parts to eat? Like, that's I know, or fruit. Because, like, or what's fruit. the economy of this? Like, why do you go there? Technically, <laughs> uh, it did get described very smallly at one point. And I think there was a huge missed opportunity in explaining how beautiful and weird the wares are in the market. But, um, I mean, there's one part where they say, like, a whole aisle is just dedicated to buttons and there's, like, scarves and silk. But we actually never get that throughout the whole thing. And all they got is fruit and body parts. And it's just, like, <laughs> I'm, like, what's fun about it? And the thing is, is it's mentioned that there are parties and the parties are crazy. But it's said, not shown. And so I don't buy it. And they're harder to get to. And so it's, like, and also, apparently, like, the only currency you really have is your own body parts. Like that's the only time they ask for payment is if they if she wants to give off her arm and I'm like no nobody's gonna do that you weirdo so let's go ahead and break into the plot a little bit just to explain it it starts in a really cool prologue I really like this prologue you're in the viewpoint of a girl called May who has been um, with her sister she has just come over from Ireland to the U S and she is basically like so traumatized she's almost catatonic. And she keeps thinking about the goblin fair and that they're going to come for her. It was such a strong start. It was. And like she sees her sister go off and her sister is talking to her and she knows she's supposed to make certain sounds like in a conversation, but she can't bring herself to do them. And like, it's so creepy. And she's like, the, the market, the market's going to come for us or whatever. And you're just like, okay, this sounds awesome. It wasn't. Dear listeners, it was not. The rest of the book 
really wastes that atmosphere. And it's not that the author can't describe gross body parts, which she does at certain points, like dismembered limbs and all this stuff. But if the atmosphere isn't there, then it just feels like a hot topic. Also, she just she's very repetitive. It's because she banks on that to be the shocking factor. We get repeated over and over again. Uh, molars, uh, heads, this and that. <laughs> With respect, that's not very creative for what's supposed to be unbelievable, like, magical things. Madness. Also, again, I think it's such a lost opportunity. It's just a goblin market, but that doesn't mean other fae don't come there to buy wares. And I think that could have added a little, a little bit more, in, like there'd be more people going on, more things, uh, humans mm -hmm. could mix in better. And then other, fa there could be a slavery system where goblins sell humans to other fae. Like, but oh, better yet, just between goblins. There is no like auction center. I'm not even sure there are other fae in this world. There aren't, uh, it's not mentioned. So what happens then is that we then flash forward. So now this will be one, no, actually this won't be one timeline. This is the end of one of the timelines. But anyway, then we flash forward 18 years to Lou, who is the niece of the of May, who is now like back to being a normal adult. And the most inconsistent, <laughs> like just uninteresting, one dimensional, like she seems like she's supposed to be interesting, especially with one aspect in particular, but it never comes to fruition. And instead she washes it away with other things. Lou's thing is that she is- Angsty. She doesn't feel like she belongs. She feels like there's something not right with her. And it is explained in a little bit in interesting ways, but not enough that I ever really felt like I felt that with the character, more that I just intellectually was like, oh, okay, I understand if you were a friend of mine, I would have explained your trauma to you like this type of a way, not in a I'm with you on this kind of um, a, a personality angst. To be fair, that actually fits in okay. And her angst isn't over the top either. Uh, it's just fine. And it does make total sense. And I actually really liked the concept. So the whole shtick, right, is that May is her aunt and uh, her mother, Laura, um, you know, we already described in the prologue, they came over to America. Well, now it's, you know, 20 years later, Lou is like 17 or so. Her mother and May are always by each other's sides, codependent even. And I think it, we could have really like put a little bit more of the unhealthy nature of that relationship in there. That would have been pretty cool. And also they're hiding all the magic stuff from her. She doesn't know. So she always feels like there's a secret between them that she's not in on. Yes, and she knows nothing about her family and none of her family will tell her anything. And so she is like the, the kid in the closet like the kid under the stairs, um, loved but neglected in a certain way. And I thought that was a very interesting concept. And then later on, we get this really cool scene that we'll, I, I'll talk about later. But we get this really cool scene where that anger bubble bursts. And then Im immediately she forgives everything after that. <laughs> and she's just like, yeah, I'm cool with this. There's higher priorities. I'm like, you're 17 years old. I'm, I'm sorry. All those years of a certain type of trauma, you're just going to wash away it's because you're prudent. That is not acceptable as an interesting dynamic character. I think the other problem with it is that this is just something she tells us and she thinks about sometimes. This is not really something that's borne out in her interactions with her mother or with, what is her mother called? Laura. Laura and her aunt May. It's just kind of like, it's informed, but we don't actually see her interact with them too much actually throughout the book. And that's one of the book's problems is that she starts the story as the main character and she ends up almost as a very periphery character like is what I found in terms of like how much page time is dedicated to her. Maybe came more more focused on uh, towards the middle. Maybe we can get into that. But yeah, I never felt like her her not belongingness really worked particularly well. Like I never felt that deeply. The other thing is that she's asexual, and that's one another way she's never quite felt like she fit in. I feel like there are specific things the author said that go against that idea and i don't mean in a good way i mean like lou has an aunt named uh neela and she's from the uk and she comes over every summer and spends time with uh louisa lou and they love each other so much and are out of each other's pockets they're about the same age too they're more like cousins i thought they were cousins for a while did you not pick up a hint of sexual tension she talks about how pretty neela is a lot no, no what really sold it to me that this is like an intentional effort or something is that at one point Lou gets a hold of Neela's phone 
And in Neela's phone is a picture of her and her friends. And she has short skirt on, a very short skirt on. And Lou thinks to herself, I'm jealous. That's not normal. So look, it's hard to tell sometimes what the, uh, the intention of the author is in a work like this. Okay, so here's the reason that I'm neither quite here nor there on it. Their relationship is not very well explored pretty much because it's going to be one of the driving motivations of this book is her wanting to save Neela after Neela gets taken by the Goblin Market, spoiler alert. And I was like, okay, we've gotten some flashbacks with her, but we don't really know who Neela is and we don't quite understand. Like, it's that thing where if a character, we're told a character is close to another character, but if we don't see it, we don't feel it. And the few interactions they do have do feel weird. Like, she just talks about how pretty Neela is a little She feels much. sexually attracted to her. Another thing we're not pointing out is that she constantly talks about how Neela is basically like her soulmate and how she wants to always be with Neela. Ne be with Neela and her and Neela will always be together. And Neela is also cool with this and how she needs to find like another half and Neela is her other half. Like it's- Codependent. And it's a, it's a foil, not a foil. It's a mirror image of her mom and May. Right. Which the book never seems to really grapple with. Like maybe that could be a little dysfunctional in certain ways. I mean, that's fine though. It can be dysfunctional and be portrayed and it cannot be good. That's fine. The problem is that she, it's, this is not a character growth arc. She actually just doesn't really interact with Neela much throughout the book, rest of the book. So it's kind of just an informed trait. Neela just feels very hollow as a character because we don't really interact with her enough. And everything she does is very like manic pixie girl almost oh my god yeah right she actually yes. is all sort of manic pixie girl in terms of how louisa thinks about her and so yeah i mean and, and i'm not this is none of this is to say that the character I, louisa isn't asexual i'm just saying i think also what katie is saying is just that it doesn't quite feel that way it really no. feels like she has a physical attraction to neela um, in terms of how it's portrayed in the book, her one close relationship, she does talk about how pretty Neela is a lot, and that's all I'm. I'll, that's all I'll say. It's a little bit odd of a contrast. This is also like the ninth book in a row we've read where it's about a woman or about a female character, and the main motivation is either saving or avenging another woman who is essentially an object in terms of how the book treats her with a lack of agency. And basically, all of this to get back to the plot comes back to she hears from across the sea. Neela calls her and is like, the goblins have taken me. And she's like, she literally references Taken, like the Liam Neeson movie later, because it is exactly that kind of a call. Oh my God, that's right. That's so on the nose. And so it is basically exactly that scene. And she, she's like, someone from the uh, goblin market is like, Come me, Wicket. Come to the market. Also, they constantly sing like three songs in this book. Um, one of which I only knew as a Simon and Garfunkel song. So I thought it was weird that it was a fairy song until I realized it's probably a It's a ballad. Um, but yes. also it's repeated so much much <laughs> that it takes away any impact that it could have had it's creepy the first time and then not the ninth also what do the songs do what do the songs do it is repeatedly mentioned and that's, that's a problem in this book it's rep repetition they are told to memorize the songs to sing them there's not one scene where they sing a song and it matters i think they're supposed to kind of like be spells or something that I never happens no you're right I, I i it's not in the book really yeah so neela gets taken um and her mom's like i have some special skills i'm gonna go back across the ocean but i'm not gonna tell you what's going on and her mom goes back across the ocean and they've never let her go home to somewhere in ireland is it ireland i thought it was northern england they had irishy accents to me <laughs> no they're english oh, God, they're in york, york i think york yes york which i actually don't know if that's in ireland or not england england okay yes no i knew that all along uh now one thing this author does excel at is describing the the city in particular. Not the goblin market, but the city. I felt the city. I felt it um, at one point, uh, May and uh, Lou, just as a small aside, you know, get off the airport because they traveled to the UK at some point. And they get off and you get the hustle and bustle of um, the, uh, London and a whole bunch of other things. And it, that is, those are good scenes, but not the goblin market where you literally could have the most fun with. And that's the other thing, which is that, so this is in the current timeline, right? But we yeah. have now started another timeline 19 years before where May is a witch in New York living her life before the goblin market. She's kind of hot. She is hot and um, she is hot and bothered. <laughs> She's very 
She need, she has an itch. She's uh, very wanting to scratch. It's an element of the book that is not really explored much besides subtext. And even then it doesn't have a resolution. And this is the part where the book is just like, hey, you know all like the rules of Buffy? Just assume that's our world now. Like there's like witches and they're part of a coven and the coven has like a deal with the fairy market. And oh. you're like, <laughs> I don't know how I felt about that. I didn't like it because the book started off really creepy and weird. And then it just ended up becoming, hey, witches, there's magic. And we don't even actually ever see the magic. It's just there are covens and there are there's witches. There's no magic. There's never any magic. And one of the key important points is that the what happened between May and Laura made May and Laura never able to uh, connect with their magic. And it's like, I'm sorry. Uh, we never get a human using, and it's referenced so much that there's magic involved. But all we get is like, oh, I've made a potion that can help with your headache. They lose their magic at one point and it's supposed to be bad, but you're like, I actually don't know what magic can do. Magic is never defined in this world. Basically, she works in a bar and she knows about the goblin market. And apparently a lot of people know about the goblin market. The people that live there every, you know, live there permanently. Right. And the goblin market is like, I don't know, it stays in town for a while. You can go there. There are rules. You, can, you can't go there if you're a witch, but if you're not, you're safe for three days in there unless you kill one of the goblins. But after that, they can, like, eat you or, like, kill you. They butcher you. The goblins really like to eat people and then, like, stuff out of them. I thought that was so overplayed, too, the eating of humans. Like, there's, I, I'm sure goblins have other things to do besides eat humans. <laughs> I would have liked if it had just been explained more, like, what? why are they so into humans so much? I, I just don't understand the allure. A good comparison, I feel like, not that Holly Black is perfect, but a good comparison is the world in Tide. Because in the world of Tide, there was politics, there was culture between the two courts, there was small little torture scenes, there were small characters that weirdly felt very fleshed out, and there were small intricacies between the relationships of Lesser Fae and Bigger Fae. I totally buy that uh, Holly Black could do that pretty well. And, yeah. and again, I remember from reading Valiant back in the day, she actually did it really well there. She did it so well. The goblins just feel very one note. At the beginning, I was like, okay, cool. We got some cool, evil, chaotic fae. And then I was like, no, they're just like cannibals. <laughs> like they're literally tribal cannibals that are completely uninteresting. Even Etra or whatever, the, like she was not, in, nobody was dimensional. We're going to get into the complete blank slate of a character she was in a little bit, which is the next thing. So May's working at the bar and like people, basically people go to the market, they get hurt and then her mom has to patch them up. And this happens a lot. Like at the beginning I was like, oh, okay. So this happens every once in a while and that's why people think it's okay to go to the market. It's like every week there's somebody who comes back with like missing a leg but having a, a tree in its place. Like really serious, awful injuries are constantly happening to people and people keep going to the market. Or corpses, straight up like torsos are just found. And I thought that was a really cool gory aspect, but it was not utilized well. Well, but the thing is, why do people keep going to this market then? Like, it's a weird- It's thing. never described well. I know, like, magic. But also, shouldn't witches, wouldn't you think at this point, have something to protect them from the allure of it? Well, okay, so it's mentioned that when the witches got I know. Them, only had go to the goblin market instead of all the time, that the witches would be more drawn to it. I'm not sure if that's Katie thinking about herself or existence. That was vodka, and I thought it was water. <laughs> God damn. Oh, that was so... F it was like it was like isopropyl You guys are about to get salty, Katie. This is one of the biggest problems is like, why do people keep going to this market? Why do people want to go there even? Like, again, we see one room where they're dancing one time in this book, and even then it's like... It's a dream of a room. It's not even described. There's no, there's no pleasure described. None of the pleasure or allure. And that's one thing I did not feel the allure of the goblin market. That is actually a really good point is that a big part of this book should be making you feel like, oh, this this is a horrible market to go to. We all know we're doomed, but we can't stay away because it has that magical something, you know? And like this book never portrays that. An easy fix. Some humans make it out and have awesome things. There are stories like that of people going to the Fey world and getting stuff like in folklore and coming back. That would have been really cool. Again, or just the atmosphere of like, oh, this is... Because the thing is like the real world has like LSD. Like you really need to work to, to like make the goblin market. <laughs> 
processed in my brain just now. The real world has Coke, LSD, uh, shrooms. Contraceptives. Like, you know what I mean? She goes to the goblin market and it, it really feels like a Ren fair. But also there's just <laughs> nothing there, guys. There's nothing there but fruit that's actually rotted, but glamoured to look nice. And look, I could buy that the fruit tastes really awesome. It's really, I mean, like, it just, it's not enough for me. I've seen too many fairy stories. I've seen too many tales. You need to hook me with something more than just yummy fruit. And so it's like, uh, okay, whatever. This is this is not well portrayed. But what gets even dumber is that May really wants to go to the market. And she knows it's a really bad idea, but she wants to go. It's not viable. It really feels like the author had this story idea and then was like, shit, I need a reason for May, who should know better, to go to the market. So I'm going to come up with three at once. First, she's bi. And so there's the allure of going with a hot girl. Which, can I point out, this is pointless because they're all Wiccan. Like, if this was a severe Catholic or Protestant culture, and it was like, okay, that actually kind of makes Thank sense. Thank you! Like, that would have been a really interesting way of the real world and the fey world kind of contextualizing. But, like, they're Wiccan. What, like, who gives, like, I don't think her parents give a shit. Which, granted, you know, it's early and, like, maybe her mom doesn't accept bi people and stuff like that. But it doesn't even matter. Look, another thing. I think you could fix this by Etra, who has glamoured herself as a really hot chick. Etra is a goblin lady who shows up one day and is wearing like short shorts and like one of those like sexy t-shirts girls do where it's tied in a knot. <laughs> I do want to go to the organ market now and follow that girl. I know, like, right? Does she understand that pornography exists? And also, like, haven't May been trained her whole life for this? Like, it just, just doesn't make any sense. Another thing. Maybe Etro was glamoured. Maybe Etro was awesomely glamoured. And maybe May was tricked. Or maybe she wasn't tricked. But build the relationship in the mortal, mortal realm and then make it hooked. That is the problem, which is that she like she sees this hot girl and she's like, I gotta bang her. And the other thing is she's gonna become a witch and be stuck there forever doing her job. And she's kind of resentful of this and she wants to go to uni, which is what British people call university for some reason. It's literally the abbreviation for university, William. Like, so she feels trapped by her family's heritage or whatever. Um, first of all, it's so hard to have sympathy for her here. It's so hard. She has a great life. She gets to work at a bar. She gets paid in this economy. Like, you know, she has... <laughs> This really shows the level that we're at right now in our generation. I'm just saying, like, it's really, her, one of her core motivations is she doesn't want, she wants, like, one last gasp of adventure before settling down, before having to be settled down. And it's, you don't, it's an, again, it's an informed trait. It's a thing the author is telling you, but you are never sh shown her, like, very unhappy. Again, if her family was very homophobic, then it would be like, okay, it makes sense that this is a dumb thing to go into the murder market after a hot girl. But like, this is a part of herself she has not been able to explore. It's a part of herself she's had to, to constantly put down. So she actually can't make rational decisions with it. It's just kind of bubbling up. You have a stellar point. If she was repressed, this would make so much more sense. If she never kissed a girl before, if she'd never been attracted, like uh, been able to pursue uh, her attraction to a girl before, this would have made total sense. When you're having to push down these feelings of repression, that's when you tend to make really dumb decisions because you can't think about it rationally because you have never actually thought about it at all. And so that would have made a lot of sense for why she does this thing. Again, they're Wiccans. She mentions it to her sister at one point and her sister doesn't seem scandalized that she's into girls. Like she just immediately thinks that even though she doesn't say anything. Also, what use is there to her in Lou's yeah. timeline? What she's the hell? pregnant and it's never explained by whom or when she's just pregnant and it's like this is it doesn't make any sense so part of the problem with the character is that you're trying to get closer to 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 her in her half of the story right may in her half of the story which is half of the book okay if this is not like a minor a side plot this is half of the book and then in loose storyline she's a really distant figure who doesn't feel like the the may we're getting to know in the other one which then no. makes it so that we don't really feel like we know the may and the other one particularly well and so you feel distance from the characters and you don't quite care what happens to them as much anyway she decides in that timeline hey i'm gonna go to the goblin market i have three days where i'll be safe i'll just take one of them and so she goes with Atra, who is the goblin lady. And then she's like, oh, I should never believe what a goblin says, but she seems to be sort of genuine. Oh God, it's so, <laughs> I, it's just like, it's so 
I'm so sorry to the author, but it's lame. It's so lame. And also, like, May is actually potentially she's a little potential to be a fun character. I mean, not really, actually. She's not really a character. I could not really tell you much about her, even though we spent a lot of the book with her. I, I This is a test I've sort of come to find with books is like, can I imagine what this character would be like in everyday life, like just having a conversation? And like, I could a little bit, but mostly in that she just wouldn't really say anything or do anything. And so as a character, she's just kind of like, mm, I don't really care. Will explained how the prologue was very engaging and how mm -hmm. May was very like, in a weird way, um, like she was detached from reality. No, she's literally detached. Look, she's been severely emotionally scarred and literally physically scarred. Why make her pregnant? Instead, make her a mad character in Lou's timeline. A mad character that is strangely good at navigating the goblin world. And instead of making May come back to the mortal realm every night that she isn't in the goblin realm, make May stuck in the goblin realm for a while. That would have been really cool. There are a couple of twists that I kept thinking the book was going to drop and then didn't and I was bored. Like I kept expecting Louisa to be the daughter of a goblin. Really? I kept expecting her to be May's daughter who was a goblin. And I and like she was just raised as the daughter of Louisa. Laura. Laura. Because at one point there's a conversation between May and Laura where May goes, Well, she's your daughter, and her mother goes, Yeah, she is. She's my daughter. And I was like, Oh, does that mean like one of them chose? That would have been so much better if she was uh okay, look. Yes. <laughs> uh Rapad. It would have been is... so much better if she was Rapad. Not actually, but it would have made more sense. And especially since goblins view humans as just like things. If they don't, it's never described that they think them as sexually uninteresting. Honestly, you could have even gone another place. Like after a while, I was like, oh, well, maybe Atra is the father. Like maybe goblins can <gasps> just do that. Like I would love that even more. There's no reason that she couldn't just be like, I don't know, Parthenogenesis or whatever those lizards do that don't have men. I mean, yes, that's even better because it makes them even more alien. Right. I was like, whatever, we're doing cool stuff. That could have been it. Um, no, that's not the case. She's just some dumb witch. That's what kind of happens in in Louisa's storyline too is that she like gets May with her and they go over to England and everyone's like we told you to stay out of this and she's like I can't stay out of this and I feel very betrayed that you guys have been lying to me all my life and they're like okay cool this is what happens when Louisa's not around and then Louisa's like yeah cool I forgive you it's because I want to get Neela no no what would have made more sense within everything else that happens in the story is that Lou is like Fuck you guys. You didn't tell me shit. And then she goes off to her like grandmother or some other witch and is like, yo, tell me what to do. Or just runs off to the goblin market, whatever have you. There's this great part. And I thought it was a good part where Lou breaks and she's like, tell me what the fuck is going on. It's the first time she curses. And I love that. But that just went downhill from there on when it came to her wrath, when it came to the alienation that was done to her. And I felt like it was not only an injustice to the character, but it also made the book less interesting. There's a real lack of like kind of friction between the characters. Everyone works together well. It feels very clearly to me like the author likes the character more than we do, like all of the characters. And so she is writing them in a way where she expects you to feel what they're feeling and, and like them as much as she does. And mostly I was just like, I'm so bored. None of these characters are distinctive. I yep. can't like, like May is making such dumb decisions constantly in the past yep. that it's hard for me to like, because literally I just cannot get past. Don't go into the goblin market. You idiot. You see three times a week, the horrific injuries that are inflicted on people there. It's not even something where she's like, Oh, those dumb muggles thinking they can go into the goblin market and not be hurt. I actually know what's up. I know the rules. And there's a certain amount of like comeuppance there. Or as, as Maria says, she has to, Eat shit, which is Maria's favorite thing in a Jane Austen novel, by the way. Like, I thought that might also have been out of a way to get, to get her in, because she goes into the goblin market at one point. Her and Atria dance a lot. She meets the King of the Goblins, who should have been a more interesting character, but just isn't. Lord of the Market, which changes based off who gets murdered by who. I wish I had been paying attention here, I, I because I hope, this is my greatest hope for this book, and I should have been paying attention, and I didn't. I'm sorry. When he's physically described, if he is not described as looking like David Bowie, then I'm sorry, what is the book even doing with a goblin 
king. Also, he was not described very well. None of the goblins matter. <laughs> like, none of the goblins feel like characters. No, they really don't. Even, they, they just feel very, like, hollow. You don't get a sense that they're doing their own thing. They just feel very, like, mwahaha. All the characters feel like literary tools to get a story across. Yeah, to get from A to B. This is a third draft that is missing character death. I don't know, man. I'm increasingly losing faith in humanity as I read more and more terrible books. <laughs> um, and like the majority of the good books we've read have been by like three authors. And those are Naomi Novik, Tamsin Muir, and... Polly Black. No, 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 continue. <laughs> Hell, no, Holly Back is actually a very talented writer. Uh, like, um, she I is. I, I would put Cruel Prince over this any day in terms of readability. And that's what happens on the first day. She then, and then Atra is like, do you want to come back a second day? Be okay, okay, here's the thing. Atra, a goblin, super attracted to May. Spoiler alert for the book, super attracted, semicolon, to the extent that she sacrifices herself and suffering for 20 years for May and remains faithful. Like, what? Why does she like May so much? What is going on? Because first of all, I don't get what her attraction to May in the beginning is besides hot human. And even then, that's not really enough to explain a lot of her actions past like day two. Day two, they go for a coffee date and you find out that she doesn't really want to be a goblin and that like goblins are like the reverse in humans and that most humans are good, but a couple are sociopaths and goblins, most are bad, but a couple are good. And she's one of the good ones. So that's essentially how it's explained later on, which is like, okay, whatever. She's the one not cool goblin, but it's never explained why she likes May. That kernel of interest, you never really get. You don't really even get like, oh, she's fond of May because she thinks of her as an escape hatch. Like, that isn't even really there until a little bit later, and it's certainly not enough there to sell her actions later in the book. None of the actions that anybody takes except for maybe Laura makes sense. And the only reason Laura's makes sense, again, Lou's mother, is because Laura actually has a weird obsession with family tradition. And also, not weird, but... A strong. Yeah, a very strong one. And so it makes total sense when she does what she does. Here's the thing about Laura. At the beginning of the book, we learned that May went into the market, Atra got killed, and Laura went in and saved her. And I was like, damn, she's a badass. And that badassness got lost throughout the book as we had to spend, again, okay, so this is the problem with the 20 years prior plot line. We already all know all of the information that is necessary to know back at the prologue. So we're spending half the book telling us information we don't know, and we're not, the, the, relationship between Atra a lot literally think about it Louisa's storyline makes more sense if the first ta if that first storyline isn't there because then we don't question why does Atra love May so much it happened in the past we don't know why but for some reason she does enough to suffer for her for 20 years why is her mother like this okay well we don't really know something happened in the past the storyline in the past actively takes away from the storyline in the present. And that's what feels so weird about this book. So much of this book is this emotional story that's not really emotional. It's kind of like a lot of plot points that don't need to be there and don't tell you anything new. And so that's why I kept expecting for there to be a twist. I was like, we're spending way too long here and not learning anything new for there not to be a twist. And there isn't. This book is like heating up your soup or food and thinking it's perfectly hot, and then you take a bite of it at your computer, and it's actually semi-cold. And then you go back and you try to warm it up, and you bring it back, and it's still semi-cold. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that metaphor? That makes a lot that of sense, relatable? Katie. Quick summarization of what we've spoken of. Okay, so we have two timelines, right? One from May, one from Lou. Lou wants to save Mila. May wants to help Lou save Mila and help Laura. They go over to the UK, and they do this thing. They do the thing successfully without very... Excuse me, I haven't eaten yet, so I have a lot of stomach acid. Uh, yeah, that's vodka. Don't let her try to pass her uh, alcoholism onto some other kind of medical condition. I am not an alcoholic. I know. Uh, I, I wouldn't put a label on it. Just you, know, <laughs> you drink to excess, but I wouldn't put a label on it. As a side note, I really liked Lou's dad. I did too. I thought Lou's dad was a bro. Oh, okay. So here's the other thing that I want to talk about is representation in this book. <sighs> There's Lou's dad, Evil Goblin Prince. All of the main male characters. Actually, almost all of the male characters in the book. There's another side character. Okay, look, book. we do not need male representation. Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. Keep your bigoted opinions to yourself. <laughs> and her dad is in like 
three saints. I love her dad. I can't believe that her dad is more likable than any of the other characters. That's because he's on screen less than the author's not very good at writing. And that's why I'm not actually that bothered by the fact that the only male character in this book is the villain is like, yeah, you're a mediocre, not very good writer. I don't care what you think. Just as rehash, at this point, we've gotten two perspectives saying the same, like pretty much a very similar storyline doesn't reveal anything special between the two. This is a tool that should be used for a specific reason. Why would you give two perspectives unless mm-hmm. there was a very special reason for it? Otherwise, you just give it from one perspective. Well, and the problem is that they hurt each other. So we're not creeped out about the Goblin Market and Louisa's storyline because we know we keep seeing it in Maze. And so it's not magical or weird or creepy. We know what she's going into. And so when she's having to psych herself up for it, we're like, yeah, it's not that big a deal, guys. Like, it just doesn't. It saps the tension from that moment. And then in uh, May's storyline, it's the tension is sapped because we know what happens because we're already in Louise. We've, we're already seeing the future. We know what happens there. It's not as though like something happened in the tunnels and no one will talk about it and nobody knows. We know. We're the audience. You told us at the beginning of the book. There are several scenes in Tithe where we get other small characters that help build the world. Um, we get a scene where we get this character named Skilly Whitten. And she's a seamstress and we get a little scene with her. Then we see a little scene with something called a red cap. We get a little scene with that. We uh, get a good depiction of the map layout of the Termite Kingdom, a.k.a. the Unsealy Court. We also get, like, some other, you know, um, non-gentry fae. And we get a lot of, like, different personalities. There is no distinctive personality between any singular goblin except... The fact that Etra is gay <laughs> and wants to fuck May. Everyone else is exactly the same. There are no even vaguely likable characters. And there are some in Tide. And like you said, having small characters like that fleshes out the world and makes it feel real. That doesn't happen here. None of this setting feels real. And especially the Goblin Market, which is like the big draw of the book. It's so empty. And the Fae don't have like a culture of themselves. No. It's the same cackling goblin prince who changes genders and i don't mean they actually change gender that would be pretty cool i just mean he dies and is replaced with an exact copy who's now female like if you think about it like okay this is not how publishing works but let's think of this like a game show you know what i mean like where they're contestants like there's different books and they have to win out over each other why would this book have won out over any other book it's so bland it brings really nothing to the table it doesn't sell you on the characters because we don't really know who they are louisa and may are both we're told about their their angst their ennui but like we're not actually shown that through interactions with the characters either in the case of louisa like not feeling like she's belonging she seems she like she belongs fine and also she has a like a crush on her aunt william william you know what sells the book the cover art that is exactly, uh, th- okay, one of the things I've realized from doing a year of this podcast is that everybody who works around the author is super talented. Voice actors, they always bring it. We have yet to, we've had one bad voice actor. How is the voice actor for this? Oh, you didn't listen to it. She's good. She's pretty good. She does um, a very good um Irish no- English accent. I don't know, guys. It's something in those little aisles. Also, it's 18 years. Not 19, not 20, 18 year difference. Between uh, Neela and- uh... No, also for a hot second, I thought Neela was actually way older than her. And I was like- Oh, also, by the way, good job author having the uh, one person of color be uh, an object that the white people have to save. Stellar. It's what we call representation. No, no, no. There's another person of color, but he's super background and he's another family member. And then he just pieces off, even though he's a really- Like for a hot second, he was a very interesting character. I think one of the the, the new witches is black, but I can't quite remember. Anyway, but it is weird that like she made Neela an Indian girl and then was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool if she like spent the whole book needing to be saved? Whatever. Um, what I've learned is that like that whole trope of like, oh, men are so sexist for always having women characters be saved. Yeah. That infringing, that is apparently a thing female authors are willing to engage in immediately as soon as it becomes convenient for their plotting. That's what I've learned from this year of book uh, reading. Fight me. Absolutely. It's not a gender thing, although it is. It's also just a, a well, it is a gender thing. Well, think of it this way historically. These authors were influenced in some oh, way. Oh, no, no, no. I know where you're going here. You're trying to do the whole like internalized it's whatever is a male canon. No, it's it correct. take responsibility. 
Okay, first of all, we have a mostly female uh, audience, so you don't need to do that for views. Who said I was doing it for views? William, are you assuming? Well, um, if you're doing it for me, it would need to be a bigger microphone. Getting back to what I was saying. <laughs> joke nice job thank you thank you basically yes the cover is what sells this book it's an awesome cover it looks cool the artist did a good job i don't understand why voice actors and artists can always do good jobs when it comes to the book and then the author is like oh maybe i'll do good maybe i won't it's because everybody needs money and so yeah that's the book i don't really think it's worth running through the end of the plot because like uh, it I, look i'll summarize it look mila is rescued through a very uninteresting struggle like there is no uh, okay struggle. sorry i do have to complain about that part of the fun of a book like this is watching the human characters outsmart the fae you know what i that mean that never happens no it's basically like atra is just like okay i'll do it i'm still here as an old person whose eyes keep dripping gems and I'll just help you out with it. Which is described like 20 times. A lot. And I was like, okay, we got it. This is a weird thing. And now you're making me just question what the law of conservation of mass is doing here. <laughs> but that's the thing is I kept wanting the uh, the human characters to like outsmart the Fae. Because that's the fun part, right? Like that's the fun part of a Fae story. Is, like, it is fun. They're bound by these rules. So then you get into like trouble, but then you outsmart them, even though they think they're smarter than you. No. It's also, it's lazy plotting. It's lazy plotting in that the author is basically just like, hey, let's just have Atra fix all these. Is there is there a problem the characters need to fix? Let's say Atra does it. Also, that's literally both situations in May's storyline as well as... Also, wait, how do you feel? I'm just like, this is just an idea that popped in my head. How would you have felt about instead of having May's perspective, having a short interlude, even if we, look, let's pretend in this book, no matter what was going to happen, the author is going to have an interlude from another perspective. How would you feel about, instead of having May's etras? I don't think the author could write it well, but I think conceptually speaking, that's a much more interesting idea to see it from Atra's point of view, especially It would have helped build the world so much. Well, and also her motivation literally drives everything in this book. Everything in this book is held together by Atra just being a Banff and super loyal to May. For some reason, because they had coffee. Literally like they had coffee and she was like, all right, that's it. I'm ride or die for 20 years for this bitch. And then she gets out and she's pregnant. Betrayal. I know. That is, it is a really odd part. And it's not even like it keeps her from going into the market later, which I thought is what it was going to be. She still goes into the market later in the book. I don't really understand what the point of having... Because look, in the end, everyone, this is a story. It is calculated and formulated. There is a reason for things. Otherwise, it's not a story. Real life is uncalculated and happens. But, re but stories, they must be calculated because they have themes and symbols and ideologies and metaphors. It's a closed system. Everything in the system interacts with everything else. Clocks don't have gears they don't need. It makes no true sense to have May pregnant. The baby doesn't get born. She doesn't have any labor pains. It doesn't keep her from doing anything. She doesn't, like, give it to the Fae or something. That would have been cool if they ate it Oh, my her. God! Wouldn't it have? Oh, what if May had always wanted a daughter of her own like Laura had? Like, let's say she wasn't, like, goblin bastard. May had always wanted to have a daughter or a son or a child once she realized how lovely Lou was. And then so she goes and gets pregnant just for the sake, which makes more sense. And then in the end, she has to give up that future of the child for Etra, the past. That would have done something with the conflict, which is more than the book does now. So overall, though, I would say that this book... I didn't like, and I kind of think it's a waste of time. But also, if you like these kinds of modern modern urban fantasy You'd be fine stories, with it. I give it a solid 5 out of 10. I give it a 3 out of 10. But also, I found that most people are pretty happy with a 3 out of 10. So if this is your jam, I, like I get that some people don't read books the same way I do. Some people just read it for like aesthetic or just like I like being around. That's why I give it a 5 out of 10. Personally, subjectively... Two out of ten. This is a good question for you. Does this book do anything better than Holly Black? Not even remotely. And I hope that it would, because listen, there is literally a quote. Oh yeah, this is one of those books with quotes. I almost feel like this author was inspired by Holly Black. I don't know if that's true or not, but it just, it, it, it's it, like, it, it smells of it. It's because of the intro and the quotes. And also, why would you quote? Scarsborough Fair and the Goblin Market by Christina Rossetti. If you're gonna hammer it home every other effing chapter, do not do that. Do not do that because it takes away 
any alliteration or anything else. I'll put it like this. Instead of reading this book, go to YouTube, go to the search bar, type in Simon and Garfunkel, Scarborough Fair. Listen to that. You've now had a better experience than you would ever have from reading this book. Again, I'm being somewhat facetious. I think if you like Holly Black, you'll probably find this book to be okay, but also it's not It would be okay, but it would not. Once you got to the middle, you'd be like, I'm losing focus. That was honestly my thing is like, I was just so bored. It was such a slog to get through. And then nothing in the end, like the big twist is that the characters talk to each other and learn that Atra is still alive. Like, do you care? Like, Louisa has known this for like three days, but May never told her Atra's name. And so then they just talk to each other. And that's the big plot twist as they find out that she's still alive. So, all right. Thank you, our parasocial darlings, for listening to us. Uh, have you read this book? Did you like it? Is there any like urban fairy fantasy type stuff that books that you would like us to read? Oh my God, please give us those. It's because that's my bread and butter. All right. Bye guys. Bye.